Okay, I wanted to show you something neat. Now, neat certainly depends on what excites you in life. Most people, the only thing that excites them in life is getting laid or getting rich. Of course, that's how much of humanity lives. Um, I'm working on the fourth edition of Uncovering the Missing Secrets of Magnetism. I made a huge discovery not too long ago. I have an equation in the book, but I want to lead you up to something as far as comprehension goes. Now, everybody's familiar with the hourglass shape. Now, the actual shape of the hourglass is a hyperboloid, a dumbbell shape. Now, the negative image of that actually is the form. This is a diagram that I actually made and incorporated into uh, the third edition of my book. Uh, showing magnetism. Now the donut shape is the reciprocating processional hyperboloid that defines magnetism. Now everything that actually has volume in the universe has volume only due to magnetism. Magnetism is the loss of inertia which designates force divergence. You have to understand, now this this is actually the most beautiful and yet the most confounding thing, not this, actually everything in general about my book and about magnetism is that it is so absolutely divinely simple and yet trying to explain it to people requires so much effort. It is like magnetism and the greatest secrets of mother nature are no more complicated than a post-it note which is a piece of paper with a, a sticky behind it, right? And yet describing it is so layered and so elaborate that it is almost confounding to think that something so simple requires, that's either a comment on humanity and where we are as far as an unevolved, you know, people still poking in the, the dark. We think we're so evolved because we have computers and other things. Intellectually, no. Creatively, as far as invention, yes. Getting back to magnetism, obviously, which is what this video is about, I'm going to show you something really neat. If you'll actually bear with me, I'm going to reveal to you one of the big secrets of the universe. Okay, I promise I will. Okay, whether you understand it or not, that's another matter. I try to keep things as simple as possible. Um, the hyperboloid. Here we're looking at the hourglass of the hyperboloid. Now, obviously, as I sw uh, flip the hourglass over, we actually have the sands of time. The hourglasses uh, date back to ancient Egypt and who knows before that. Now, obviously, on either end of that bulb, the hyperboloid, which is what that uh, geometric shape is, which designates a force in motion and inertia and acceleration. It is actually a conjugate geometry. One is Euclidean. What is Euclidean is magnetism because it actually has vectors, right? What is trans-Euclidean? You see that little narrow spot at the middle of an hourglass? There is no time there. What defines time? Time is not a thing in and of itself, just as a shadow is not a thing. A shadow is a privation of light. We actually speak about, uh, you know, the darkness as if it is something in and of itself. We refer to evil or we refer to, uh, you know, darkness, the lack of light. That is not an entity. It's not a principle in and of itself. You know, there is uh, gold and the gold lion statue, if you will, but there's no lion in the gold, right? You have to understand this is a, a methodology of platonic thinking that's been lost thousands of years ago. And it is only through translating ancient Greek and my, you know, extreme love of unfolding the mysteries of field theory in conjunction with understanding, you know, apophatic uh, dialectic methodology that was lost ages ago, um, um, uh, as used by the ancient Egyptians and the ancient Greeks, I was able to unravel all of this stuff. Bear with me, I'm getting to it, I promise. Now, this conjugate geometry, if you will, now one is geometric and one is uh, ageometric, it is trans-Euclidean, and even Euclid himself talked about the geometry before geometry. In other words, a point is still a Cartesian coordinate. Now we have the donut, okay, which is going to define magnetism. Now we have to understand how Mother Nature draws a line. Mother Nature doesn't draw a line like this or like this. She draws a line like this. However, geomagnetic precession, I hope you know what precession is, because what defines magnetism not only is Mother Nature's line of the loss of inertia, which defines magnetism like this, but it is also this in conjunction with this. And if you extrapolate this out, what you end up with is precession, like a processing top. Okay, let me actually grab an analogy, okay? 
This is precession. You know how a top spins, it actually starts to precess? That's geomagnetic precession. It exists along a frequency. It's known as the Lamore frequency. Okay. Now, Rawls and Davis, and they never knew why. They wrote several books. Here's the, uh, the equation for a geomagnetic precession. Okay, and megahertz, megahertz Tesla times Tesla. Now we can actually change things by increasing power. Now, in normal life, we're dealing with incoherent matter. The only thing that actually defines a laser from a light bulb, for example, is field coherency. The only thing that defines a magnet, as opposed to uh, that lump of neodymium, iron, boron, or samarium, cobalt, or ferrite, whatever sort of magnet it was, before it became a magnet, was one thing only, and that was not anything substantial or physical. There's no change in the quantity, rather the quality of that principal entity, which is field coherency. As is the case, discovered by Rawls and Davis, and possibly those before, uh, before those two guys, and now they're dead. They wrote three books on magnetism and its effects on living organisms. I've done countless seed experiments. I've told people to go replicate it. Anybody on Earth, even a child, can replicate this, and I've got lots of videos up showing that field coherency okay, actually affects living organisms. You can just do seed exposure only, not while you're growing them, it's more radical while they are growing, but you could just expose the seeds for half an hour. What that does is it causes a temporal displacement depending on which, and I'll explain that in a second, depending on which uh, pole, now a magnet doesn't actually have poles, it actually has the inverse to counter space or inertia. You see this plane of inertia that exists right along the center of this uh, hyperboloid? If we actually take the negative image of a hyperboloid, we have the donut, i.e., Okay, the force divergence, which not only extends out like this, but also processes like this. This is a known entity. We cannot even build a magnetic resonance imager without knowing Lamore frequencies. They can actually change the Lamore frequency and change the way a uh, MRI machine is calibrated. I mean, you can look that up yourself on Google or YouTube and uh, type in the Lamore frequency. Now. What actually was affecting the living organisms that Rawls and Davis never figured out was that given field coherency, okay, we have polarized time at a rate of 1 to 5, but 1 to 5 in the system. But that also exists at a rate of 1 to 5 squared relative to the rest of you know, the normal human world where if you grow a tomato, you know, anywhere in the United States it's going to grow the same if you have the exact same conditions and whatnot, same seeds. However, we have a rate of phi, 1 over phi, but 1 relative to the rest of... And this, this is kind of hard to explain. <laughs> It's really very simple. It actually exists as an egg, rate of 1 to 5. However, it's 1 over 5, or 0.618. So we have polarized time that exists along the uh, North Pole of 0.618 of polarized time to 5 squared, 2.618, relative to the rest of the ambient world that we all live in, obviously so, which is phi. If you actually did countless hundreds of experiments were done by Rawls and Davis, and this is not about the animal or seed experiments, uh, showing uh, that seeds were affected, worms, birds, chickens. Uh, if you actually wanted to uh, grow tomatoes that had a really low acid content, all you had to do is expose the seeds to the north pole of a magnet. Now, they knew they were able to repeat these uh, experiments over and over and over again with absolute, they even got a patent on a magnetic bar that would actually uh, roll over top of alfalfa seeds. There's actually, like, if you grow alfalfa seeds, you actually have to roll them in a cage as you water them. You know, they had a magnetic bar underneath there. They actually have a patent uh, for accelerating the growth of alfalfa sprouts and a certain seed growth. So they actually have a patent for that. It's too bad the two guys are dead now. But what is time? Getting to back to our hourglass, Along this plane of inertia, there is no time. All time is, and time is not an entity of itself, neither is a shadow, 
Okay, a shadow is nothing other than a privation. Time is a measure of magnitudes. Magnitude is a synonym for magnetism. Anything that has magnitude in the universe is strictly due to magnetism. But in dealing with incoherent matter, which is what us human beings do, wood, trees, other people, you know, our houses, uh, the dirt, you know, uh, the rest of the visible universe that we walk around, that is all incoherent Okay? Incoherent phenomena, matter. What we're dealing with when we talk about uh, strong magnetic fields, where we have field coherency, is we have polarized time. In the case of uh, n uh, nominal matter, we don't have polarized time. It's completely incoherent. I mean, obviously you can't... Well, actually, uh, with extremely strong uh, Tesla fields, we're able to levitate frogs and strawberries. We're talking about, like, oh, Lord, what, five, six Tesla uh, fields? But it is the case that we can actually change the little more frequency, and I have an equation for this in the book in the fourth edition. See, this stuff is actually, it is so simple and divine in my mind, and yet it requires, it actually pisses me off to a certain degree that it requires this level of extrapolation to, you know, you have to go to one step to second step to actually explain to somebody what the hell is going on. Yet it is so simple in and of itself. We're actually able to change by changing the Lamour frequency. We're actually able to expand and warp that bubble of time. What if we were not able, since, since light is not a speed, there's no such thing as a speed of light, it's actually a rate of induction. What if we were actually able to accelerate ourselves through space? Now, space is not a thing. Once again, it's privation. Actually, space is uh, the after effect of the wake of the loss of inertia that defines reciprocating precessional hyperboloid that defines matter and the universe at large. But what if we we're able to compress, and that is what we have over here, by power application, by changing the Lamour frequency and disproportionately affecting the polarized bubble of a ship or of an entity in a fixed spot somewhere on the earth we're actually able to change that through changing the Lamour frequency where we have say a two gigahertz field versus a what are we here we have a like a nominal field of 120 megahertz down here through the application of increasing now understanding the lag of, this is also called uh, electromagnetic retardation by the way relativity uh, thinks that space and time are things that actually affect we actually have this plugged into uh, the uh, GPS satellites uh, due to their speed, and that is actually attributed to relativity, but it's not. It was a known entity long before Albert Einstein came along. It was called EMR, uh, uh, yeah, EMR, Electromagnetic Retardation. There's an entire book written about it. By, it's a big, thick book by a guy who had two PhDs, Dr. Oleg D. Jefeminko, Electromagnetic Retardation. When you actually have a procession in a field you you have as a lag effect the native uh, lag effect is uh, i think on the nominal field of a typical coherent uh, magnet for example the Lamour frequency is like a 120 megahertz what if the application of power and this is how magnets are actually created in a magnetizer through a known entity we're actually able to change the field polarization by power application to have a ratio of, say, uh, phi cubed to 1 over phi to the power of negative 3, what we would have within this temporal bubble of polarized time, we would have a disparity, a phase disparity. This is a normal disparity of a, a normal polarized field in the magnet. We would have a phase disparity of a rate of phi cubed uh, to, say, for example, 1 over phi to the power of negative 3, and we'd have uh, like a 2 gigahertz uh, geromagnetic precession. What would that mean? That would mean that any entity within this volume of the field coherency of the applied power would be experiencing slowed time. Resultantly, we would have a compression of space such that, say for example, if it took uh, a thousand years to travel a certain distance, it would take, depending on how much power you could actually apply, it would take you know, three or four or five years. So instead of a thousand year journey, through the compression of space, and space is only the wake front of uh, the loss of inertia, i.e. magnetism. Magnetism, magnitude, and time are one and the same thing. There's no such thing as space. Nikola Tesla very famously said this. He made fun of Albert Einstein and the rest of the... He said, space has no properties. That is a direct quote from Nikola Tesla. Time itself is not an entity. 
Time is nothing other than force divergence as a measure. Time is only literally the measure of magnitudes and the passing of magnitudes. Magnetism and time are one and the same thing. The ultimate point is to get this uh, reduced down to its most simple thing is by changing the Lamour frequency through the application of power we're actually able to change the phase geometry or the phase disparity of an entity in a specific volume. Have I gone too far? I mean, all of this is actually very simple. It's incredibly complex, but it is so divinely simple. This is nothing other than simplex phase disparity electromagnetic retardation. By the application of power, we can actually change. It's kind of like squashing. Imagine an egg if you could actually squash it. Through the application of power, the loss of inertia and the phase disparity would change such that we are actually able to change the phase disparity, i.e. the time lag, in an entity or a volume such that at the leading front we would have temporal compression and at the trailing front we would have uh, um, uh, temporal displacement. Sounds like Star Wars stuff, right? Sounds like Star Trek sort of stuff. No, I... Yeah, I watch Star Trek, but yeah, their whole yeah. No, I'm not. I don't go. I don't go for the science of Star Trek, which is basically all atomistic. I'm actually being dead serious here. Uh, geomagnetic precession is a known entity. It's literally what magnetic resonance imaging machines work off of. Polarized field coherency. We have polarized time. Countless thousands of experiments done by Rawls and Davis on living organisms. Now, we don't deal with, we don't, there, you know, I've got a huge magnet in the other room. I mean, it's a thousand dollar magnet, but never still, it's only about yay big. I mean, we don't deal, human beings don't deal in ultra powerful Tesla coherent polarized fields such that we were able to experience this phase disparity. But if we could create one without scrambling our brains, we would actually experience a bubble whereby which time and space are compressed as everything else around us is actually changing. Time is not a thing. Time and uh, force divergence, i.e. magnetism, is uh, compressible. It is compressible through changing the Lamour frequency and actually changing um, the geomagnetic precession and the geometry along the plane of inertia of any magnetic field in a coherent polarized system. I don't know if I actually made this. It's so this is this this is actually quite simple and yet explaining it I feel like I'm being so extremely obtuse. People have to understand, you know, the conjugate geometry of force and motion, inertia and acceleration. We have to understand what a hyperboloid is of uh of uh, acceleration. We have to understand you know, the geometry of what magnetism is, the uh, the toroid, the torus that actually surrounds each and every polarized system, whether it be magnet or electromagnet, that is the force divergence that actually, and you can see it underneath the ferrocell, okay? It's very, very evident. You can see the plane of inertia under any underneath any magnetic viewing film. We can see the polarized time effect on living organisms, seeds, worms, birds, chickens. You know, this is not uh, science fiction, the experiments that were done by Rawls and Davids. Anybody on Earth can take these living organisms and expose them to coherent, uh, coherent polarized fields and see the radical difference. I mean, I've made countless videos of seed experiments showing they, they grow radically different, they, they smell radically different, they taste radically different. You know, this isn't science fiction, it's science fact. How come we didn't learn any of this shit in school? I mean, Rawls and Davis' experiments have been around now for decades. One of their books, by the way, was suppressed. Anyway, I'll talk more about this later. Maybe I've talked too much already. Thanks for watching. Okay.